pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce uh, Yikora Stadlali on my feet. We'll talk, uh, we'll, I think, continue in, in the same spirit as the same talk, uh, last talk, with some recent developments in wave turbulence theory. Please. Thank you. So, first, thanks for the invitation. Um, I guess the invitation came before pandemic, so I thought there would be no hope to actually be here. But I'm glad that we are all here, healthy and free from masks and such. Um, so yes, this is a little bit of a connection with what Jalal said. I will do, uh, we'll go a little bit into math and maybe say a little bit more of what I knew before I joined the collaboration that uh, Jalal mentioned. So this is what we wrote on the web page of uh, our, our collaboration grant. So what is wave turbulence? Um, I guess it's uh, the definition you, you understand when you see it in a sense. But basically the point is that uh, uh, if you have a system in which there is a large number of waves interacting at different scales in particular, of course it would not make sense to understand what is the dynamics of each single wave, but in fact what is the statistical ensemble. It's a little bit like what we do when we use the Boltzmann equation in order to understand what a gas does. So this is instead of particle are waves, and um, in a sense the wave kinetic equation that uh, Jalal uh, mentioned several times would be the counterpart of the Boltzmann equation in some ways. It is an important equation to understand, an important um, phenomenon that of the general wave turbulence because it affects a lot of uh, uh, physical phenomena at different scales and are just that here for a, uh, just for comparison something very large, something like regular scale and something very small that for quantitative. Okay, so um, again if we consider a PDE and uh, even dispersive fluid or whatever, yesterday we heard in the talk of Philip that uh, uh, the idea of uh, energy moving from uh, different scales, let's say low to high before the cascade or high to low or backward ca cascade. And it's a concept that is very much um, uh, that influences many different phenomena um, that are described by different equations in a sense, with different properties, a different way of attacking them. But in general, let's say we have a PDD and we have um, U, P of X, this is a wave, and uh, of course, it depends on time, so I just put an input 0, capital P, and the x variable is on a certain domain. And in fact, I will address a little bit Philip's uh, question, which is the fundamental, in fact. But for now, let's think of M to be either the whole space where we don't impose any boundary conditions. And if you're looking at dispersive equation, there is a big phenomenon of dispersion that uh, uh, comes about. Or the torus, this is the periodic case in which the person is not acting. So these are, and you will see throughout the talk, the, big, the first part, um, that the two domains really have different uh, properties. And what we're looking at is what we call the energy spectrum. And uh, uh, you can see why I picked Rn and Vn, because I'm looking at the Fourier coefficient. So in this context, that's what the energy spectrum is, is the magnitude square of the Fourier coefficients. And of course, k here, it's a natural number if I am the periodic case, and it's going to be in the continuum if I am in an Rn case, in the whole domain. So a major question is, in wave turbulence, is understanding the properties of the energy spectrum. Now, um, the transfer of energy. So this is a question that uh, actually goes back to my times when I was uh, a postdoc at the IES of uh, uh, Jean Bourguin, and, um, and he was uh, interpreting um, in a very mathematical way what uh, the <coughs> idea of energy transfer, um, how that idea could be translated at least in some mathematical context. So in particular, let me just fix for you the equation that I will be looking at, that also Gerard considered. This is like the cubic NLS, it's defocusing. And for now, let's think about x in R2 and P2, and then two-dimensional. Um, this is the first interesting 
um, type of dimension to consider, also because if you are in dimension one, this is an um, integrable system, and I will mention to something different happens there. And here you have your initial data. And you really would like to start by saying that U0 has finite mass and finite uh, energy, which is the Hamiltonian. Now, the question that we then, the way he phrased it, was the following. So suppose that at time zero, I'm giving you this uh, is the graph of uh, um, Q1, this is the representation of the energy spectrum. As a graph, the U0 tells you are you looking at time zero, and it's localized near small frequency. Does it happen that later on in time, you will see this blob moving to higher frequency? If such a thing happens, it's going to have to be sort of a rigid type of dynamics, especially because the conservation of the mass will tell you, for example, by Planchard, that the area of the subgraph is constant. So certainly there might be some movement that something could be <laughs> determined and understood. But if it does happen, for example, the area of the subgraph has to remain constant. All right, so that was the question. And uh, um, one way that Bougain, uh, well, let me first tell you what happens, obviously, in the linear case. In the linear case, this is the Fourier coefficient. You just get um, multiplied by e to the i t k squared. k squared here is the first relation that uh, um, Joao talked about. So when you look at the absolute value of that square, there is no movement. Everything is constant, nothing changes. Um, and Bourguin decided if you are in the nonlinear case, maybe one way to see whether there is a, a motion from low frequency to high frequency um, can be detected in a sense if we uh, multiply by the multiplier of k to the 2s, let's think of s to be greater than 1, um, and then summing over all the frequency. Now, you recognize this as being the HS norm square. And what we would like to understand is what happens t goes to plus or minus infinity. This is a reversible equation, so whatever we say at plus infinity holds on minus infinity. So what happens there? Does this grow? So this is the uh, famous question of uh, the growth of the sobering norm. So we are interested in that, exactly related to this phenomenon called the cascade. Now, in the nonlinear case, but in R2, and here I'm just, like I said, I'm fixing dimension two, but anything I'm saying can be also derived in some context and uh, with some kind of uh, limitations for higher dimension. So if we are in the mm, nonlinear case, but uh, in the full domain, no boundary data, then there is scattering. This is a result of Dodson in 2014. That says that there are two profiles, u plus and u minus, which are in, each, in HS. I'm taking S greater or equal than two, sorry, it should be zero here, um, in L2, so it should be zero here. Um, such that when you take u solution u and you subtract the linear evolution of this profile, in HS, again, S greater or equal than zero, and you look at T plus and minus infinity, that goes to zero. As a result, as a consequence of this, via you know, trigonometric triangular inequality, you get that the HS norm for any S greater or equal than zero is uniformly bounded. Of course, it will depend on the initial data, the size of the initial data, but it's uniformly bounded. So this question here that Bourguin is asking, it's really um, not um, so interesting in the uh, full domain without boundaries because there is uh, a control. And as I mentioned before, if we are in dimension one, the initial value problem that I just uh, presented, which is the cubic one, the cubic, it's an integrable system. And if you combine the conservation laws that you have in the right way, you can say that any hn, where n is a natural number, is also uniformly bounded in time. So the question of uh, what happens to this quantity, um, the first interesting question is in uh, the periodic dimension two cubic. So um, there is another. So this uh, what I presented, which was a Bourguin's um, idea that started developed in the late in the mid nineties somehow, um, has a counterpart, which is what uh, uh, Gelan was talking about before. Perhaps it would be much more effective if we could get an equation for the energy spectrum altogether. Like if we can get an equation, uh, an evolution equation of this quantity, so how does that change in T 
um, as an equation itself. And then we studied the equation, and we know a lot more about the evolution of the energy spectrum. So that effective equation is indeed what we mentioned, which is a wave kinetic equation. Now, um, as you see, this derivation of the effective equation for the energy spectrum, as we know it now, or at least what we know, um, it's um, understood in the physics world in a formal manner. So there's a formal derivation, but for a weak nonlinearity, meaning Think of the view of uh, um, Jalal in front of the nonlinearity, which in my slides will call, be called an epsilon. So when that's small, so the action of the nonlinearity is weak. And there is a derivation, for example, you can read of it, and Jalal also gave you an idea. In Nazarenko's book, it's done in a slightly different way, but the end product is always the same. And I'm going to actually present for you the idea of Nazarenko on this derivation. And then, of course, there is the rigorous derivation, much harder than what Jalal was mentioning before, and I will uh, talk about that as well. So uh, there are these two ways of thinking about it, these two problems of, um, let's think about energy transfer. One is the original idea of Rougain. It has no probability whatsoever in there. Everything is completely deterministic. And then there is the second idea, which is the idea of the deriving an effective equation, which is the wave kinetic equation, and uh, that's done when you have to assume that you have a weak nonlinearity. So I'm going to start by telling you something about the first uh, type of question, the one that we're then um, somehow introducing you to, uh, which is on the energy transfer. So I like this picture because this is a, a think of the steps to be just frequency and the water falling down. That's my forward cascade that we're going that's only the reason why this is here. I'm not talking about water going yeah. down here. Okay, so now when you want to, let's go back to the question of understanding the dynamic of HS. Well, there are two questions that you wanted to address. First, if this HS grows <coughs> over time, how much can it grow? That's question number one. And then there is a second question, which is even more interesting, and in fact, more difficult in a sense, um, can you exhibit a solution that actually has an HS norm that grows? So how should you take the initial data so that that happens? How does that happen? And so on. And I can tell you right away that neither of these questions is completely resolved. There are partial results for both, at least in the constant uh, context of NLS. And uh, since Patrick is here, I'm saying in the question I had, similar question he addressed for the Zago equation, much more is known. Okay, so let me tell you just in a summary what we know in terms of the upper bound. Um, this is a combined works of uh, several people, Bourguin, Soinger, and then there is uh, um, uh, Panchon, Sertog, and Michelia. And uh, at, at least um, in general, when you have just periodic data two dimension, uh, and I'm going to go in a second, I'm going to go to the point where when uh, the, the torus is rational and irrational, which we go back to number theory coming in, what should that be important, which is related to the question of healing sound. But in general, if you just have periodic data, um, you would get a polynomial bound where the degree of the polynomial is basically S. Remember that if you S is zero or is one, since we are in the defocusing case, you have a uniform bound by using the conservation law of the mass of the Hamiltonian. So that's, this is interesting for S greater, strictly greater than one. Now the proofs of these results are, you know, there are different proofs, um, so-called high-low method, upside-down high method, both of them which uh, use a stricter test in it, or a different point of view, which is that of Lanchon, Seth, and Michelia, which is more, um, it's, it's based more on intuition by R. Um, now, uh, if the torus is irrational, and this will be a very important part of my next few slides, and then uh, you expect that this polynomial here has a lower, lower degree. And in fact, this was, uh, uh, in a way, exploited and uh, proved in some sense by Benjamin and then in dimension three, though, not for the equation that uh, I just put here, um, it was in higher dimension. Why do we expect that there is a, a lower degree here? 
Well, because in a sense, the rationality of the torus, it gives a little bit more space for the weight to, um, not to disperse, because there's no dispersion here, but if imagining the way of hitting the boundary and not being in the rational torus, then when you bounce back, you will not go immediately on top of yourself, in a sense. So the, um, there is a little bit more room to uh, spread out. Um, so let me now go to the other direction. So I told you a little bit about the upper bound. Now let me tell you about, do we have solutions that actually grow? Now, this is an older theorem that uh, I proved with the Coleander theorem that I in town. And um, basically says the following. Again, the same type of equation, but now the torus here was really a square torus, but you can do the same thing when you're rational in this uh, original theorem. And it says the following, fix your order of derivative. By the way, these theorems are basically for smooth solution, okay, because we are thinking about S large. And then fix a small constant sigma and a large constant k. Then I can construct for you, this is a constructive proof, an initial data u0, which is in S, NHS, which has a, a norm with more than sigma. And if we wait long enough, then the value of the HS norm of the solution um, is going to be larger than the fixed k. Now, there are several, um, several problems with this problem, with this theorem here, in the sense of it doesn't really tell us what happens after capital T, it doesn't really tell us there is even a logarithmic growth for the solution. Um, so it's limited in, in what really uh, answers in terms of the question of is there a solution that grows. Um, so I also want to mention that much more recently, like I, a couple of years ago, there is a result by Giuliani and Guardia, which is exactly the same, but they, instead of assuming that the torus is rational, they can prove the same result if the torus is irrational, but the irrationality of the torus is very weak, meaning that there is a number, which is an irrational number, but that irrational number is very well approximated by a fraction. And so it's a sort of a, um, perturbation of this lemma, this theorem here, if you change a little bit the, the, from rational to irrational. Now, um, let, after we prove this theorem, there is uh, the people that actually know how to do dynamical system, you will see why if you do dynamical system, you could prove something better. Um, they uh, looked at the proof again, and they, for example, they were able to give an estimate of capital T and uh, uh, give a little bit more information in the theorem itself. Now, but how is this proved, this theorem? Um, well, let's, I'm looking for a solution that grows. I'm thinking of it as an ansatz, so I'm writing it in terms of this coefficient a and t, and uh, um, this is the, the linear part. It's sort of like, a, like Jalal said, I mean, the linear part is not an important thing, so you can kind of mod out by it. So we are looking for utx that is like that, and now we're gonna plug the u inside our cubic NLS, and that will give us an infinite system for the coefficient a and t, so an infinite ODE. And uh, um, here we assume, in, in order, since we are trying to prove that something grows, our intuition tells us, well, maybe we should look at frequencies that are in resonance. And that's what's written here. So the, um, and you have an output with n, and that's given by the interaction of n1 and 2 and 3. These are three waves interacting, uh, giving us n. And the restrictions are n is equal to 1 minus n2 plus n3. This is completely uh, evident from the fact that you go from a cubic in the physical space to um, the, inter the um, gosh, now I'm blanking on how you say it. Uh, yes, in the frequency, yes. Um, so the, um, um, okay, so the relationship between the frequency and I'm gonna be like that. And then the fact that I'm looking at the resonance, it tells me that it's omega four, which I'm defining to be the size of the first frequent square minus the second plus the third minus the n itself is zero. So this is the resonance, okay. So this is from convolution and this is just from the <coughs> Now this um, uh, system here will come up later again. So we're gonna see this again, but for now let's leave it as that. 
And of course, if you have infinite power and you knew how to control this infinite system in a dynamical system point of view, then you could understand the whole dynamics. But this is infinite, so you know it's not easy to control in any way. So you want to make this finite somehow. And uh, indeed, we do that. So we reduce. By the way, I wanted to mention <coughs> that already when you are right, you're solving the system. This is not the original NLS because you're only extracting from it the resonant part. So you're already making a little error that you have to keep track of. And then later on, we restricted even further the frequencies that are um, in the uh, resonance with each other to make a finite dimension system, and we call a toy model that looks sort of like this. So it's just the nearest um, neighborhood interaction. It's a finite dimension. And so we can solve that. And it's actually simple how you swap. It's not simple how to solve, but the idea how what you want to do is pretty simple. So for example, this system, although we did a lot of the reduction that I mentioned, um, conserves the mass and conserves the energy. In particular, it conserves the mass, means that when you take the square of the absolute value of j, that's constant. And if you normalize, you can then imagine that this whole dynamics is going to happen in this complex sphere, in a sense, because this just tells you that when you sum all the components of the complex vector x, that's equal 1, 1 is just because I normalized, but otherwise this is really the conservation of mass. So everything happens on this sphere. And then on this sphere, there are uh, spatial circles that are invariant for this system, meaning if you start the initial data on one of this circle, it's just you keep rotating. And really what you want to do to understand this forward cascade is to go from, let's say, the first circle, that would be when the first component of this vector is one and all the other ones are zero, and then this one has the second component one and everything zero, and your goal is to go from near the first one, of course not on top of the first one because you keep rotating there, but near the first one, avoiding all the obstacles and getting to the end. That's the follow cascade. Basically, that's how we prove the theorem. But then, of course, <laughs> this is not the original question. This is not the original system. So you need a pretty strong uh, stability theorem that tells us that you can go from here to the original, which we do have. OK, that's basically how that theorem goes. Um, now, I also want to, I didn't mention this. In fact, here I'm sort of combining two talks. So if I were giving two talks, I will mention also there is another important result in terms of forward cascade, which is of a different flavor, but it's uh, on the same idea by Carl and Faru. So um, there is another. Um, but the dynamics is still on the rational torus and is still going from very close to the origin and moving forward and see what happens. Now, are these results sharp? When I say this, I mean the upper bound and the construction, the solution. They are absolutely not sharp. What do we expect? Well, at least in terms of growth, we do not expect more than log of t. Um, and this is also based on a uh, um, very important series of work that we put in on the linear with potential NLS. And then that line of work uh, really developed into incredible strong mathematics with a bunch of people from Italy, actually, very strong people in the dynamical system. And I will be not talking about that. Um, and this is for the linear with potential in different domain, Tarkov's domain, not just periodic. Um, and then I just want to mention, uh, is there a situation in which at least we know that there is a logarithmic growth? Well, this is a work of Hani Pusader and uh, um, Setko from Vichilia. Uh, the difference is that their NLS is in a mixed um, domain. So there is a one line that's R crossed with the torus. Okay? And in fact, that's, uh, um, this is the, what they obtain, that in a certain sequence of times, there is uh, um, some growth, which is global. Now, um, I wanted to mention some uh, more recent results on the irrational Um So let me just say the following. In a sense, what I'm going to say here, and the, the reason why I want to stress what happens with rational torus and irrational torus and so on, it goes back to the fact that indeed when you wanted to understand this dispersive equation on a domain, as for now, we know how to do things in the periodic case or with 
sorry, logic boundary condition because we can use the Fourier transform. But is this really a good representation? And what I'm trying to say here is that because the situation, at least in the context of this growth of subvolent norms, is uh, different if you are rational or irrational, then this should make people pause a bit when you make the condition that whatever you try to describe in the periodic case is what, ha what actually happens. So you have to understand how, what is the limitation of making that kind of assumption. And the point here is that, in fact, there is a difference. Okay, so, um, but from the point of view of mathematics, which is what I really like, I, I love to talk about this kind of stuff because uh, it, it's a pretty subtle. Um, so this is a work with uh, Babsky and Yulin Pan, and uh, uh, Jelan mentioned him. So um, Alex and Yulin are actually doing the numerical part of this work, which I'm not gonna present here, but uh, it's, uh, it was really interesting to see what we could actually uh, find numerically and match that with what we did um, in, um, in a mathematically. And they somehow, in spite of the fact that we think that everything that's numerical must be rational, because okay, that's what we can see, they have a way of figuring out of um, what happens when you are assuming that the, your periodic data is uh, irrational torus. Okay, and then Bobby Wilson. And it, it continues to some work that I did with Bobby probably before. Now, let me just, since I talked about rational and rational torus, let me give you a definition of two dimensions. This can be also um, extended to higher dimensions, but in two dimensions, it's very simple. So the torus uh, T2 alpha, and the alpha is this irrational number here, is irrational if when you take perhaps the symbol of your Laplacian in the torus, and you get omega 1 square, this is a positive number, k 1 square, these are the first components of the frequency. And then omega 2 squared, and this is the second component of the vector frequency squared. So the bottom index in this, in this slide means the component, and this is actually the power. So if you take the ratio between this number and that number, that's a number alpha, which is positive, and if it's rational, it's a rational torus, if it's irrational, we call it rational torus. So the main theorem that I want to mention is the following. So assume S is greater than 3, and you use the solution of the cubic diffocus NLS on this irrational torus, and the torus is really irrational. Think of alpha to the square root of 2. So that's just saying that the alpha is not just irrational, but that needs to be far from being a fraction, which tells you that this is the component of what happens of the results of Guardia and uh, Giuliani. Take an initial data in 0, which is an X, and assume that the support of the, this Fourier coefficient is in a ball of radius r, then the HS norm it goes like a polynomial of translinear, basically. Okay, so it's, uh, there is no more S here, it's linear. And um, um, here I, I put the dependence in R, I should have put also the dependence on the HS norm of the initial data because that obviously is in there as well. So um, in the rational torus, you really do have um, better upper bounds because the rationality allows you, as I mentioned before, to spread a little bit more. Okay, <clears throat> now I'm just gonna give you quickly the elements of the proof. Um, I'm gonna define a set, in a, uh, you know, I talked about quasi-resonant, but here you could see the definition in this context associated with my initial value problem. Um, we will show that uh, the initial value problem, which is uh, connected to the, the quasi-resonant frequency set, is actually globally wave codes in L2. And uh, um, it does, in a sense, it decouples into one-dimensional objects. Um, I will be more specific on that, but that's uh, what uh, I wanted to, that's a fundamental part of the theorem. And then the stability because we will be able to say quite a lot, quite, quite a lot about the quasi-resonant initial value problem, which I'll write to you in a moment. But then, you, just like in the previous theorem, you have to go back to the total uh, system. So you need a stability landmark here as well. Okay, so what is the four-wave um, resonant or quasi-resonant set? So let's start with the resonant, and let me um, just show you how you decompose into two one-dimension um, resonant uh, description. So the, if, if R, R is my resonant set, so let me call lambda k to be exactly the symbol. If 
Michel Warren a square, it would be just k1 square plus k2 square, which is the usual absolute value of k square. That's the one that we have been seeing. That's the frequency, the, um, the, uh, the uh, usual way you write the, the symbol. But if you are in the rational case, or um, not exactly the square situation, then you show this guy show up. But now think, just for sake of argument, that this is one and this is square root of two. So that you can see. And then you see that when you write your resonance set, which has this condition here from, a, um, from before, and now this is replaced with the k1 square minus k2 square and so on, because now the symbol is different. Then you see that there is no mixing between the first coordinate and the second coordinate. Okay, so that whatever happens in the first coordinate is not going to mix with the second because you cannot get the square root of two here. So you can, and the k's are all natural numbers, so they just are separated. So the this r can be written as now two conditions in the first coordinate and the second coordinate. Now, sorry for switching things around, but now the i on the top stands for coordinates, which coordinate I'm looking at. So if I put the one here, it means that I'm looking at the first coordinate. If I put the two here on the top, I'm looking at the second coordinate. So because the this irrationality of the torus, they will just split. Okay, this thing will split into two one. Um, and so we'll decouple. Now, in a way, um, this is absolutely not made clear, and, and I thought about this, but it's hard for me to, to, to think about it in a sense. But in a way, separating into two one dimensional objects, it sort of tells us that it's not quite two one D NLS. But this, the fact that the one D NLS is integrable, somehow affects what I'm going to say later. Now let's go to the quasi-resonant. Um, so you enlarge this set a bit, and the way you write it is, well, not exactly equal zero, but I want it to be less or equal than some large lambda, and then down below where you have uh, the size of your, uh, um, of your frequency to the one plus tau. Well, this, the reason why there is one plus tau here, and the reason why um, you write in this way is because there is a, um, um, a way of describing how much a certain number, irrational number, is close or not close to a fraction. And uh, this tau will show up in there. I'm not going to uh, go into detail. Um, this constant lambda, think of it to be large, in fact, later on. And uh, you will see more of this when we go, and we just mentioned this, to the uh, small denominators that will show up. Okay, now let me state theorem number two. Here I have the same equation, except that now instead of taking the whole nonlinearity, I'm only I'm going to restrict on the frequencies that are in quasi-resonance. So just the quasi-resonance uh, initial value problem, if you want. And uh, you can prove that you still have conservation delta to norm. It's, you can do this in frequency space. And if, due to the fact that uh, my definition of the quasi-resonance is symmetric with respect to all the frequency. And uh, um, I can prove that this uh, NLS is globally with force in L2. And uh, um, basically, this tells you that if you start with initial data in a certain ball of radio R, then you actually stay inside a ball of radius M. That's what it says. Um, that's what it, this just tells you that the HS norm of the evolution outside a larger ball is going to be zero. Um, now, and all of this will depend on uh, just on lambda, tau, and r. So let me just make a couple of remarks. Um, in the theorem that I mentioned before, where I for the growth, uh, where I said I could pick something as small as I like and make it as large as I please, the whole growth dynamic was already happening in the resonance set, which is uh, uh, um, basically embedded in my quasi-resonance set. So you already see the difference here. There is no growth here in the rational case. So the theorem of a, a very rational case, I should say. So that theorem here will not hold. And that's exactly because of the rationality. Another thing that I wanted to remark is if you look at the whole problem, so the cubic NLS in dimension two periodic, it's not well known whether it's well posed just if you assume that the mass is finite. That's a very, it's a major open problem 
that's due to the fact that when you do the strict abstinence, you lose an epsilon derivative, and so you cannot remain in L2, which is not true if you are in R2, because in R2 we have, a, you know, there is a um, more dispersion. So the problem, the full problem in L2 is not known whether it's well posed, but the, the quasi resonant property is when you are very rational, okay, not in general. Okay, so a corollary of what I just said is that uh, at least for the um, solution of this, uh, the star one, which is the one resolved from the quasi resonant set, you have uniform bounds for the solutions of that one. And that's uh, um, what the proof of this is pretty simple. Is you can prove that outside a certain large ball, you're zero. If you start, of course, with the um, uh, compass of Popper de Bellini, and then when you do your triangular inequality, if you have less than m, well, you can use the L2 norm, which is bounded, it's bigger than m, you're zero, so that's the uniform bound. Okay, <clears throat> now the ingredient of the proofs. A very important fact to, to note is that if you are looking how many frequencies, um, okay, quadruplets of frequencies, are such that you are non-resonant, but you are quasi-resonant, how many of them? This is a finite number. And the finite number depends on uh, the large lambda, the tau, and uh, the alpha itself, which is the rationality of the torus. But there are finitely many. So in other words, when you're looking at the quasi-resonant um, frequency, um, you, the, the infinitely many are only the ones where you have equal here. Everything else is gonna be a finite number. And then, uh, this is an important fact, and the second important fact is exactly the fact that you can um, separate the resonance set here, when it's equal to zero, into two 1D resonance sets. And as I said, recall that in 1D you have um, integrability, and that somehow is uh, um, inherited in a way here, in a weak sense. Okay, so the, what is the main proposition? I'm not gonna prove for you, but the main proposition says the following. Now, if you define this quantity, which is not quite the HS norm, okay, this is just the, if you like, is, um, I mean, two dimensions here, so I'm gonna just for your sake of, a clarity, the K is a, a first coordinate, second coordinate, and this is basically another way of writing the, um, the weight, the K to the S, and then this is the solution of my quasi resonance <coughs> Then this uh, DDT of this quantity, when you take a larger than M in one direction and the other direction, is such that if M is large enough, the, um, this is constant outside outside the large ball. Of course, here I'm always assuming that the initial data is, uh, is uh, compact at the beginning. And uh, it's interesting, the proof, because there is a, um, it's, you really, uh, because you can separate your resonance set into two one-dimensional resonance frequency, there is a lot of cancellation, and you just do it by hand. And it's no way that you can translate this in something which is not the ratio or anything like that, it will not work. Um, okay, so this is the main, the main part of the theorem. Now, as I mentioned though, okay, all this is all good for the quasi resonance set, but how do you go back to the original one? So, in this stability lemma, what you need to estimate is the part of the solution which is non quasi resonant, right? So that's, uh, and what is that part of the solution? And in particular, you want to show that that's small, because otherwise everything, uh, this would not be an approximation of my original problem. So if you look at the, the total solution of the um, original system, and in fact, I wrote it before, there is the quasi-resonant, which already dealt with, and then there is this other part, where theta, which is this guy, is now non-zero. In particular, theta to the minus one is bounded by that. So remember, theta was bigger that uh, lambda over this quantity, the tau plus one, so theta minus one is less than this. Okay, and here you note that I'm summing on the complement of the quasi resonant part. So this is what I wanna make small. And how do you do that? Well, you do integration by parts. Now this guy is non-zero, 
um, right? So you have to you do integration by parts. That common denominator, that's the um, large denominator problem, the small denominator problems. And uh, this lambda hand is on the denominator now. And you say, well, but you lose quite a lot of derivative here because there are all these k's. And in order to control that, we use the polynomial bounds of the HS norm that was already known. So it's a combination of known facts from before and the fact that you manufacture this lambda k in the bottom, which is a, a large quantity, and that's the whole point of using classic exponents. Okay, so I'm going to stop here for uh, um, the part that has to do with the, uh, the polynomial bounds, and now I'm going to briefly, in the next 10 minutes, um, talk about from dispersive equation to kinetic wave equation. All right, so um, this is, a lot of this was already mentioned by, by Chenal, so I'm just gonna go fast. So this is the um, NLS. Epsilon is the weak nonlinearity. You already encountered the parameter L, and luckily we use the same letter. L is the size of the torus. And then you have an underlying probability that it's a, uh, um, it's expressed in the, in the case that Jelan talked about, with the, assuming that initial data are Gaussians or whatever. Um, um, you can be yeah, more general, but anyway, that's a good example to keep in mind. So there is a probability background. And what you're interested in is the expectation of the uh, spectrum here, the normalized with uh, this, uh, um, this is called the kinetic time, epsilon to the minus two. And then you take the limit as L goes infinity, absolute to zero. And Jelan mentioned that the, you know, the, in the reverse derivation, there is a link between L and epsilon. In the more formal derivation, which is done more freely, there is a, exactly what I wrote here, L goes infinity and then epsilon to zero. And then it pops the wave kinetic equation. And, um, and, and Q, which uh, we will see in a moment, but uh, um, also you saw in previous slides, Okay, so now um, there is a fundamental original work of this type, and uh, uh, these were people that have introduced, start to introduce this wave kinetic equation, in particular Hasselman got Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for his work on climate change, and in particular he studied ocean and the height of the waves, like, just like uh, um, Jelan said. And in fact, you mentioned before, uh, Jelan, where the Feynman diagrams start happening already in his work. They were the first Feynman, but like, like you, it didn't go further than two or three directions. So yeah, so that was just the beginning. Okay, so that's where it started, but the, 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 in this works, um, and what I'm gonna show you is the derivation of Nazarenko, is uh, um, the, the argument became more and more formal, but still it was uh, more and more rigorous, I would say, but still it was uh, very formal. And so you take the various, so you, you assume certain probability properties, and then you take certain limits, and you ignore certain terms, and then it pops the wave kinetic equation. So let me give you an example of a derivation. So Jelan gives you one kind, and I'm going to give you another kind, but it's uh, basically the same type of argument. And I'm going to uh, consider Zakharov Kuznetsov of equation. So this is a more for wave. If you think about it, this is nothing else but a multi-dimensional version of the KDD equation, okay? So you have, uh, um, this is the derivative order three, you will see the derivative x cubed if you were in one dimension, and then here you have quadratic nonlinearity and the derivative with respect to x. We are, this is a multi-dimensional type, we are in the big box, so size L, and uh, there is some probability behind, we are looking at the expectation of that, and uh, we want to uh, derive the equation, and I wrote for here what the equation is. You recognize the same delta function that uh, Jelan mentioned for the um, <coughs> dispersive relation right here, and the delta function from the fact that you take convolution. And then here you see just two, two ends because we are com it's coming from a quadratic. So this is called the three wave um, uh, equation. And one thing to remark is the dispersive relation. This is a, a k squared coming from the Laplacian, but then it has the first component of k. And this is much more nasty than to what the, the Schrodinger does because you cannot compute the square with this. And it's, it makes life extremely you know, sad. But anyway, so um, that's what it is. And let me briefly tell you how you do derive um, formally at least. So you first normalize, you want to get rid of that derivative in the uh, first component of x. 
And then the assumption that you read in the book on Azarango is a random phase amplitude fields. So the AKA are random phase amplitude fields. So you have independent both in the amplitude and the frequency. And what you're looking at is a solution of this kind. So you expand with an epsilon, there is an epsilon parameter, so you want to say which uh, part of the solution is of order epsilon, which part of epsilon square, and so on. But you stop at epsilon square. So your kinetic time is epsilon to minus two, so you say, well, this is all I can to do, and I'm not gonna go further. So you're really interested in understanding what is this guy, this guy, and that guy, and then you plug inside the equation, and you see. And I did the calculation, well, maybe I copied from another angle, but the first one is just the initial data. There's nothing about that. And the second part, the second point is the one with epsilon as this uh, expression. The V is just a, a combination of K, it's not important here, but there is this first integral. And I wanted to match this with the first um, final diagram. So we start with output K, but that's given by the input K1 and K2 in this relationship. So this is the first diagram. Then you move on. What is the order epsilon squared? Well, you plug it in, and now you see two integrals, and you see three frequencies. That one, so you have the original one, K, that splits into K1 and K2, and then the K1 splits into K3, K4, and there is the symmetric one, of course, when you split the K2 into K1 and K2. Anyway, but that's how it looks. Now, these diagrams are exactly the ones that will account for your equation, for your wave kinetic equation. But if you do this uh, rigorously, you have to think of all the other diagrams like Jalal mentioned. So not just this one, which are the ones that give you the equation. Okay, so then what, what do we do? Well, we write expectations that we'll be taking this product and then you match them. This was the matching that Jalal was doing on the final diagrams of a different types. But here I'm stopping only at epsilon squared, so I'm not gonna go further. I used the random phase amplitude properties, lots of swing cancels, then you take the limit as n goes to infinity, the epsilon goes to zero, and there it goes. So this is another way of deriving the equation for the KDD type thing. Now, the mathematical literature. Um, so the original serious derivation of uh, the kinetic wave equation in the linear but uh, uh, with random potential was done by work of Erdo Xiao, Erdo Xiao, and Yao, based on some um, techniques of Schwann. Um, so this is linear, and it goes even beyond the kinetic time. This is a recovering the diffusion, that there are some beautiful notes of, uh, uh, I think, uh, Erdo uh, on that. And then Lockerin and Spawn were the first one that really looked at the nonlinear problem, uh, but at equilibrium, meaning the probability that you, or the probability um, the density that they use is the one attached with the Gibbs measure, which is invariant. So there is no change in time of how the probability um, distribution happens. And they, if you read their paper, there is a, it's a heavily set on the spinal diagrams and the combinatorics and all of that. So this was uh, their work. And then there was uh, quite a long um, um, wait time until um, Buckmaster, German, and Anishata start looking at this. Now, one big difference between their approach and the approach of the um, Erdo Xiao and so on, and Lucarinen, is that uh, in this case, the NLS is in the continuum. So it's in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a box, but for any X. While the work of uh, um, uh, Lucarinen and so on and so on is a discrete, it's in the discrete set. <coughs> Instead of an equation, it's really a difference equation, and which makes things much harder. So already Jalal mentioned uh, up all the way up to the uh, work of Deng and Hani, and then I wanted to say that in the discrete case, uh, there is some recent work of Lucarin and Roxana, and then the Ma, um, okay, and then I did the work I'm gonna um, talk in a, in a little bit for like a very short time, and Ma is a student of Leonesco that also looked at the DK equation. Okay, so um, do I have a few more minutes or I should just stop here? It's good if you round off. Okay, good, all right, so I'll just take a few more minutes. 
So I just want to mention that uh, this is the work with Bean Fun, and this is really done by Bean. He is, uh, he is really fluent in the language of Luferin and Stone, and I was collaborating with him, but definitely he's the one running the project. I just want to mention that because of the uh, very complicated situation that comes from the dispersion relation, which is harder, the fact that we consider the problem in the discrete sense, so just on points instead of the whole box, um, mm, sort of forced us, in a sense, to consider the, the equation, but in a stochastic way. So adding a stochastic term that you see here. And this is the fact that we are in the discrete, so we are just in a lattice, if you want. Um, and then, okay, I'm going to skip this because that tells me what way is discrete. Um, and uh, all right, so then again, what we want to look at is uh, uh, the expectation that's uh, a square, and this is my density function. There is a different perspective as well in what we do because instead of looking at the evolution of the equation, what we decide to look at is at the evolution of the density. Um, so let me just write for you the theorem. It's exactly what you expect is that when you uh, take this quantity, which is the expectation of the Fourier coefficient square, um, and you take uh, the limit of the x term, which is the, the weak term linearity, and the limit of the L first in the order upon L equals infinity and F equals zero, this indeed goes to F infinity, which satisfies the equation that we want. And it is at the kinetic time. And just to conclude, just the difficulty, um, this rigorous derivation is to um, use again the Feynman diagrams or graphs. The discrete setting, the fact that we are in the lattice, makes the situation much more complicated. The dispersion relation is very singular. Um, and the quadratic nonlinearity, actually, one might think that being a quadratic nonlinearity of cubic is better, but instead it's not. And uh, that's the last slide. So how do we resolve it? Well, we concentrate, as I mentioned in the study, on the evolution of the density instead of the evolution of the solution itself. The stochastic term acts only on the angles. It has an action as an act on the magnitude of the Fourier coefficient. That's why you don't see it appearing at the end in the uh, kinetic equation. Um, but it gives some regularity to the real equation that the, the density satisfies. Um, and then we also have to look for a weaker type of limit. So when you take the limit as L goes to infinity and epsilon goes to zero, well, that's a, in a sort of weak sense, which can be it's made rigorous in the paper that uh, I'm not going to talk about here. And because of the stochastic term, and because we are looking for a weaker term, for us, the L and the epsilon are not linked, so they are uh, unlinked. And uh, I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Guido, for your talk. So uh, I'll take uh, five minutes of questions, and then we'll have the next talk five minutes past. So please ask questions with your comments. So uh, back to what John was saying, so you are able to estimate this uh, interval final series? Uh... Right, right. Um, it is done uh, differently than uh, um, in the work of uh, um, Ben and uh, Annie because we um, use the properties of the evolution of the density function of the rock instead of using the first estimates that come from having the solution in the, um, in the continuum, which we don't. So we, are, we have a, a, it's a discrete setting that we have. But yes, we have to do a lot of combinatorial thing and separate the graphs into the graphs that are like the one that I show you. Uh, those are the ones that will give you the equation the kinetic wave equation, and the form of the kinetic wave equation. The remaining ones are the ones that uh, you have to prove that they are less than an epsilon to some power, and so you can send it to zero when that goes. Yeah. But there is a heavy combinatorial argument. Yes, hello. Yeah. Uh, one point which I never really understood. You, you said the discrete case. Why can't you take the continuous case? No, no, you can. Oh, you can. They absolutely. The point is that we were basing our work on the previous work of uh, 
um, Luke Karin and Spawn, which they are math physicists and they, they didn't, I don't know, probably physically, they thought that, that was the system to look at. So we looked at that and we wish that we had not done that because it just introduced quite a lot of difficulties uh, extra. In fact, the, to make it worse, it's not just a k first coordinate absolute value of k squared, it's a sine k and then sine squared, you know, all that. So it's more complicated this presentation. Okay, so, so I had a question. So you mentioned the log in the beginning, <coughs> and I know that it didn't the rest of that. So can you say something more about the log and also if, it's, if you expect it to be related to the S and uh, yeah. Right, so we don't, uh, so for the nonlinear problem, it's not at all clear what should happen, and there is not a fixed conjecture, except for the result that I mentioned of the Soleri and uh, Annie and so on, where they have uh, so this weird like exponential log log, so it's not clear, and it's not clear how it should be related to S. But what is more clear is what happens in if you have a linear with, uh, random, with uh, potential, not random, just potential. And there, it's about uh, starting with the log again. There is a, um, an upper bound, which is log, or I cannot remember exactly how it's written, but then he can construct a solution that goes like that. So that uh, exhausts the upper bound. So that's a completely settled situation with certain properties on the Vs, and then uh, some of those properties have been written and so on, but there, there is a lot more clarity. For the nonlinear part, it's not clear. Okay, thanks. So then I suggest we, we thank you. Thank you.